Story continued from Allosaurus episode. On the plains of the late Jurassic, the body of a deceased Diplodocus lays motionless where it fell. This subadult was brought down by a pack of four Allosaurus a few days ago, and it has become a magnet for all forms of scavengers. Of course, all had to sneak past the hunters that brought the Colossus down in order to feed on it, and the large predators didn't share, even when they were full. Feeding when the Allosaurus were preoccupied or vacant is the safest strategy, and from the cover of the forest, a different group of predatory dinosaurs is hoping they are in luck. Through the conifers comes the small pack of Ceratosaurus, with their lead female walking ahead of the rest. The scar-faced female sniffs the air, but cannot detect any recent Allosaurus activity, though smelling anything over the rotting Diplodocus carcass is difficult. The scar on the side of her face thrummed whenever she was near Allosaurus territory, as if it was one of them that had given her that scar along with many others on that fateful day. But then again, that was also the day she fed on Allosaurus' flesh for the first time. The group had been scanning the area for a while now, and it appeared the carcass was abandoned. Perhaps the larger predators were patrolling their territory, or had gone to the river for a drink. Either way, the more time they wasted, the more likely it was that the Allosaurus would return. So the pack moved in, they broke into a jog, keeping their bodies low to the ground as not to be seen. As they got closer, they heard the sound of thousands of insects that were feeding on the carcass, and saw at the neck of the sauropod that they weren't the only dinosaurs present. A pair of Stokesosaurus is greedily picking at the corpse, searching for any fresh meat still available. These are actually early tyrannosaurs, but at three meters long, they are far from their distant Cretaceous descendants, and no threat to the Ceratosaurus. The four predators move to the carcass's underside and begin to probe for the fresher meat. This is the second time they have scavenged from this kill, and they are just as cautious as the first time, raising their heads into the air every time they swallow to make sure the coast is clear. No sooner have they started, however, do they hear an angry roar. From the very path they came from, come the resident Allosauruses, returning from the river, and none too pleased to see their kill being feasted upon. Spinning around, the Ceratosaurus see that it is the dominant pair of Allosaurus, and not the full group of four. But even though they have doubled their numbers, the Ceratosaurus begin to back away. Never turning their backs to the larger predators, the Ceratosaurus growl lowly and take measures stepped backwards while the smaller Stoxosaurus run as fast as they can. Except for the lead female Ceratosaurus. She jumps up onto the sauropod's leg to get higher, and snarls at the Allosaurus, challenging them with a piercing glare. The larger carnivores have never seen such a display from a Ceratosaurus. Clearly, she was different from the others. However, seeing their leader stand up to the Allosaurus, the rest of the pack stopped retreating and started to roar back. They didn't advance, but they held their ground. The Allosaurus duo lowered their heads and flexed their claws, ready for a fight. The choice was down to the scarred female. Fight or flee. Then it came. A roar that rolled through the valley like a thunderbolt. All eyes turned to its source, and there, standing at the top of the hill, was the rarely seen Alpha Predator, Sorophaganax, the largest terrestrial carnivore on Earth. Just like that, the atmosphere around the carcass changed, and all the large carnivores were struck with fear and hesitation. The 13-meter-long Sorophaganax is a relative of Allosaurus, but significantly larger and heavier. As it advanced down the hill, its thick muscles flexed and tightened, a perfect picture of a healthy adult male. Tall, bold, and unfazed, even as it approached the six smaller predators. Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus alike began to back away, steadily putting distance between themselves and the approaching giant, sending tremors through the ground with each footstep. 
Even the female Ceratosaurus, who was so eager for a fight, quickly retreats and joins her pack. The new arrival looked at the pack of four and growled lowly. He then turned to the Allosaurus and snapped his jaws in a mock lunge. The duo turned tail and took off back the way they came, knowing better to be within the vicinity of a Sorophaganax when it ate. Taking the cue, the Ceratosaurus pack also retreated, their gamble with the carcass a failure. The scarred female waited a moment longer than her pack. She watched the Allosaurus run back into the forest. She hated them, more than any of the others, and one day she would taste their flesh again. One day she would taste vengeance again. The huge Sorophaganax watched as the last Ceratosaurus cleared the area, and proceeded to tear off a huge chunk of flesh and bone from the Diplodocus carcass. His type were rare here, but when they did show up, every other animal either fled or kept their distance. His species is built to tackle some of the largest and most dangerous game the Jurassic has to offer. Even the large sauropods feared the thunderclap-like roar of a mighty Sorophaganax. Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the controversial Sorophaganax. Sorophaganax was originally discovered in 1931 and was originally named Sorophagus Maximus until it was realized that that name was already taken by a small bird. It was renamed Sorophaganax in 1995, which means Lord of the Lizard Eaters. It lived 151 million years ago in the late Jurassic era, living in Oklahoma and possibly New Mexico. Fossils of Sorophaganax are fragmentary, with mostly a few vertebra and leg bones. With these, scientists have estimated it grew up to a length between 10 and 13 meters, and weighed up to 4 tons. This would make it the largest land predator of the entire Jurassic era and similar in length to Tyrannosaurus rex, though nowhere near as heavy. However, for as long as Sorophaganax has existed, there has been the debate on whether it was its own species, or simply, a larger Allosaurus. The bones of Sorophaganax are very similar in appearance to Allosaurus, so much so that in 1995, Sorophaganax maximus was named as a species of Allosaurus, simply titled Allosaurus Maximus. However, many scientists believe that the differences are genuine, enough that Sorophaganax, though closely related to Allosaurus, should be its own unique species, and as of recording, still is. Since we have so few remains, it makes the debate almost unresolvable. It is important to remember that Sorophaganax belongs to the Morrison Formation, a formation that is some of the most famous Jurassic dinosaurs, like Stegosaurus, Dryosaurus, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, and Camarasaurus. Sorophaganax fossils are an extremely rare find, making up less than 1% of the fossils found in the Morrison Formation, whereas Allosaurus remains make up 70-75% to of theropod fossils. This could be that Sorophaganax was never common when it was alive. Since it was so large, it likely never had a high population, as there was only so much food and territory to go around for a small amount of individuals. With that being said, Allosaurus was quite large itself, and it is by far the most common predator, so it may be that Sorophaganax was only an occasional visitor to this region, and less likely to fossilize there. This is what's known as preservation bias, where a species isn't fossilized as often as others for varying reasons, such as them not dying in areas or in ways that make fossilization less likely. Whether it is its own unique species or an extremely large Allosaurus group, Sorophaganax was clearly a formidable apex predator, an ambush hunter that would rely on its bulk and strength to bring down small prey, and likely went after tough opponents like Stegosaurus, even juvenile sauropods. Possibly, when it had to, go after adults of small sauropods as well. Like modern apex predators, Sorophaganax could have also scavenged the kills of other carnivores, and with its size, it could intimidate any other predator off their kill without having to expend its own energy, 
The subject of if these megatheropods could take down huge sauropods is a matter of debate. After all, it would be a huge risk to not just an individual, but a whole pack. But with areas like the Morrison that are dominated by sauropods of many different kinds, I personally believe that this is the reason why we see predators the size of Sauropaganax. Perhaps all it needed was one good enough bite on the neck to sever enough vital organs and the animal would bleed out, leaving a huge carcass to pick over. But that's just my theory. For those of you who watched my Mamora Pelter episode, you'll remember that one fossil of that nodosaur had bite marks that were too large to be from an Allosaurus. At the time, I said it was likely from a Torvosaurus, but there is of course another suspect, Sorophaganax itself. Do you think this is enough evidence to prove Sorophaganax's independence as its own species, or do you think it's just the larger species of Allosaurus? Let me know what lesser known dinosaur you'd like me to do a breakdown on next, and until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.